Hi there, everybody. This is Patricia Windrow at the Cable Easel with a program which is uh, working from life, landscapes, still life flowers, portraits, and um, landscapes is the uh, subject matter today, specific landscapes, mountains. This is part two of a program that you've seen before, I hope, uh, called uh, Let's Bash the Mountain Paintings that are around today. Uh, with a little of humor, I, I hope, not too much, um, not too much uh, criticism, but uh, just a question of pointing out what I have find is beginning to be proliferating all over the place are these mountain paintings that are unobserved. Uh, not very convincing, but nevertheless, they are stemming from some of the programs that are there painting jagged things against the sky and calling it mountain pictures. So. I talked about mountain pictures in the first one. I'm doing one now from a sketch that I did in Colorado a couple of years ago to show you that a sketch can be just as valuable as uh, more valuable than trying to remember or even from a photo than a photograph because it's spontaneous and it's something that you personally have sat and drawn. There it is. It's a pencil sketch that I brought into the studio. I mean, pen and ink sketch that I brought into the studio done in about, oh, let's say 45 minutes and color notations telling me the information that I need to transfer that from a pen and ink drawing to a painting. Whether it's watercolor or oils, there are the notations. That's my language. Uh, as you can see, uh, it reads all sorts of things. I'm, I've, I've, I've taken care of the very pale sky and the no clouds and the misty mauve mountain in the distance and the rusty rocks and so forth. And I'm working my way from the background to the foreground, namely the one that is closest to me. Um, Having paid attention to the center part and to the distance pieces where I've tried to keep the colors very down, very low key because of the problem of distance, I'm going to be doing this side of the, uh, this side of the mountain which uh, tended to be somewhere in the amber colors and uh, I'm going to put it in rather rapidly because there's a lot of work to do in the foreground and in the little um, the little dew ranch that is in the uh, that is um, uh, by the side of this little lake I'm mixing some color for this side for this mountain on the side here going to put it in really uh, very uh, very freely uh, it is a sort of a nondescript uh, mountain tone in which is going to become a variety of things such as evergreens and tall, magnificent tall trees. The best that we can do on Long Island, as I said at the closing of the part one of this program, is that we find a hefty cliff and we call it uh, our sized mountains. Uh, there is one over on the wall there. It's the Port Jefferson, uh, not Port Jefferson, it's the Crane's Neck uh, area called uh, Crane's Neck. Uh, well, we call it a mountain. We Long Islanders we keep trying to put something here that isn't here, which is, uh, of course, natural. But there is the best that we can probably call a mountain. It's a wonderful cliff rising out of Long Island Sound, and um, it's, um, it's, it's the most mountainy we can get here. So that's why I thought I would bring in the sketch that I did uh, getting away from Long Island for just a moment so that we can talk about mountain painting, which is very, very much part of a painting uh, all over the world. Uh, the uh, Europeans came over here in the middle of the, in the early part, in the middle of the 19th century. Albert Bierstadt was one of them. He must have gone completely bonkers when he saw the size of the mountains here, and he went out into the West and painted some of the most remarkable mountain pictures that were ever ever, ever conceived. They're in the National Gallery in Washington. They're in the Metropolitan Museum. They are uh, to be seen by Curie the Curious uh, at any time when you go to these wonderful uh, museums. But mountain painting cannot be eliminated from the fine arts painting scene because it has been, well, it's been around for thousands of years. The Japanese have been painting their Japanese mountain mountains for thousands of years. And um, because we live on Long Island and have local origination programs doesn't mean that we should completely eliminate the uh, problems and the fascination of painting mountains. Well, while I was talking about that, um, I have filled in in a very free and loose manner uh, the um, the uh, left side of this picture, which is the uh, side of the uh, side of a mountain, and into that side of the mountain come the. Uh, the growth of evergreens, which I talked about before. I'm going to use my sketching brush, which is my, um, my nice layout, a thin, th very thin brush. You must have this to do these. And starting with the ones that are way off in the distance, a very tiny, mostly 
interpretive pair of little evergreens sitting up here on the on the uh, on the on the top of this of this uh, uh, cliff. I, this looks like to me like it's rocks, and it's way off there in the distance. Does not need much color, probably a little bit more than that. And as we come as we come become closer to the viewer, namely the painter, you will see that the trees become well. They were, they they remain awfully small on this little uh, on this little uh, on this little this enormous uh, mountain that's coming down the side here. And we'll get some idea of scale of how big these things are when I get the people and the horses in in a little while. Um, I always think that uh, bringing the human form in is a good idea because that'll tell you something about scale. And, and scale is important because you want to make sure that people understand just about the real anatomy of the of the painting that you're of the of the painting that you're working on, and here, uh, the, the, these trees are so tall, even though they're in the foreground, they go way past the top. And this is the point of reference that I always talk about when people say, "I don't know how to big make big make things big or little." Uh, you use the top of this mountain. The sketch tells me that these trees are uh, be begin to be apparent above the um, the line of the mountain, which is the way um, you you use a point of reference. Um, the uh, uh, the interpretation of trees is uh, is also another problem with some of these mountain paintings. They uh, a, a great big brush of color is is sort of whacked out against the uh, canvas, and hopefully it looks like a tree. And you've got to understand the anatomy of the tree. I mean, pine trees have pointy uh, pointy branches. They're not even. They are not just cones of green. They are they are. Carefully interpreted because uh, you know you got to respect that thing up there. That thing it must be 150 feet tall. You can't just sort of dismiss it with a bad portrait. It it, it deserves one's one's uh, close attention, and. Uh, as you come down, then it becomes all sort of mixed up with some other ones. Uh, w with time allowing, as, and as we wind up the program, I'm going to continue to do these uh, trees uh, next to one another, but I wanted to show you how you approach it and how you paint them carefully uh, with observation. Uh, many times they are just in silhouette. Many times they do not have a lighting on one side of the tree with pale green and the other side is dark with a darker green. That is absurd. It doesn't work that way. These trees have got a tremendous amount of of anatomy to them, but they also have you ha also have to be observing and see what it is that light does to them. Uh, I'm very concerned about the, the the bad and misinformation that is taking place with these uh, with these paintings that I see all over the place that people have done, spent lots of money, time, energy, and enthusiasm on uh, art supplies and so forth, and out comes paintings which are not observed. They are not. They haven't taught you anything. They haven't given you any feeling of what it is to really sit and paint from life or to paint from a comprehensive sketch, which is what I'm doing for you right now. Using a sketch, I've never painted this picture before in oils. I'm using a sketch that I did a number of years ago, haven't had time to get to it. And this is my opportunity to work. This is absolutely blank. This is what I do. I get, I get my sketches and I go back to the studio or to my wherever I happen to be and I paint from the, uh, from the sketches that I have done. This one is an absolutely uh, primary, prime, primary no attempt to do to interpret the uh, pencil sketch, uh, the pen and ink sketch that I did uh, a couple of years ago, and to apply it to canvas. As you can see, there is no quick solution to painting an evergreen. It has to be dabbed and daubed and thought about and paid attention to the design. Uh, they are also never, almost never the same height. The little ones grow next to bigger ones. Some have burned down, some have been chopped down, some are simply slower growers than others. And therefore, if you see rows of equidistant, same sized of pine trees, unobserved, not taken from life, not real. Uh, and I keep touting the business of being a realist painter because um, that's my thing. I am not an abstract painter. I am a painter that is trying to record. So as you can see, those three trees took some time to do, not, not as much as I would like to. The trunks can be, uh, the trunks in these great wonderful growths out there have been uninterrupted for such a long time that they are in fact perfectly straight. But then the, then the branches at the bottom are a little bit sharp maybe they've been eaten by deer, maybe they have been uh, broken off by any number of reasons, but they don't come down to the ground in a Christmas tree design. They come down to the ground in a war, in a natural design, whereby the bottom branches maybe are not as healthy looking as the top branches. 
uh, something that is uh, very little they pay very little attention to the accuracy and the uh, the the real concern for being a recorder of a scene and I'm a recorder of a scene like a newspaper reporter does it in words I have to do it in pictures so using my uh, using my trusty sap green the only green I'm willing to sp squeeze out of a tube and tempering it with the burnt sienna my trees are beginning to take shape hopefully they look uh, they look somewhat like what I am hoping they will look like, namely a natural looking tree in a natural environment. Fortunately, there is a little bush in front of it, maybe a little yellow one. I never, didn't make notations about this, but let's say that the trunks of that tree are hidden behind some bushes. It's on my sketch. I uh, didn't make a notation of the color of that bush, so I'm kind of now working uh, uh, with my memory, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, obviously necessary. Here is a, here is a bank of, of, of some kind of growth. It's more than likely um, uh, huge weeds. Maybe it's even de deciduous small trees that are beginning to take uh, shape in this, in this ridge of mountains. And here, more than likely, there may be some, you know, some deciduous trees uh, turning red and pink and sienna colored in the fall tones, which is what this painting is doing. Um, I have some. I have a very pale uh, area here. Uh, I'm going to be maybe play with it and say that this is a, a field that has a slightly pinkish amber tone because there are meadows of wonderful growths of. Um, of wildflowers that turn these meadows to different colors. Uh, sometimes they're even as brilliant as, uh, as uh, uh, and once in a while you will see uh, a, um, a growth of larkspur or one of some of these mountain flowers that will turn an entire meadow a, a, a pinkish tone. Absolutely remarkable and something not to be missed. Well, okay, uh, because, because we're wearing on in time, I want to get this little, um, uh, get me another brush, which is uh, this one, and put in my, um, Dew Ranch. Uh, they painted this. It is very rare that you will see Dew Ranch as anything else but natural wood. But I do recall that this ranch was painted white. This little, this little depot here where the horses are up for hire. It was painted white uh, probably for visibility so that people could see it. And um, uh, the, uh, it turns the corner here and it's got a sort of a shed roof in the back. Uh, as you can see, I'm, I'm following my sketch. Maybe this should be a little bit grayer so that that can be, sh so that the sunlit side of this building is, um, is uh, distinguishable. Then, of course, the roof is more than likely just, um, see, I didn't take notations on this, so this is where I have to rely upon either my memory or uh, logic, that the roof of this little building is uh, probably uh, dark-ish. I do recall, however, that the barn was kind of barn tone and, it, uh, and a, a natural sort of uh, wood that has darkened over the years. So this little uh, side of this barn, which is obviously the horse barn, is a, dark, is a darker tone. And it's beginning to show up against, this dar uh, against the background. I'm going to use the sky blue that I had up there for the, uh, for the color of the roof of this barn because it's indicated to be light. But I'm reasonably sure that it's probably made of metal, which means that it would reflect the sky. It would uh, it would be a bluish tone reflecting the sky. Uh, something that you that you learn and you you get to be so smart about it. You begin to understand if that's a metal roof, it probably is pale blue. And by golly, most of the time it is. Here is the um, here is the sunny side of this building, and then the uh, shadow side of the uh, of the shed building underneath here, where everything takes place. The horses all gather, the people gather, and you go off with your little guide and uh, and uh, feel that you have hit the the Great West, uh, like some kind of an errant cowboy. Oh, it's great fun. People, people come back saying they, they just couldn't get over riding through these mountains. And here I'm going to just very quickly uh, interject, and I'm not a great, ho great horse painter, but I'm going to try to give some, so, some feeling about what it, uh, what, uh, what it, uh, the size of the, of the horses that were there at that time. This is probably not going to look like anything but a mule or maybe even a tiger, but I'm going to try and, try and uh, give you some idea of the size of the horses compared to the size of the mountains and the buildings. Uh, let's see if I can get a better profile of a horse here. Little ears, little profile, little neck. Oh gosh, it's, uh, well, you work on these things. You don't attempt to throw these out in a hurry. <laughs> 
Um, yes, well, you know, you, if, you've, if you've got the goal to get in front of um, uh, live TV uh, and, you, and you're there making, doing something very difficult, the chances are you're going to probably make some kind of a mistake or at least try and pull it off. This little tree here gives you some idea that this tree is either a very young one or it's a good-sized one, and this is a, a decent-sized barn for those horses. Anyway, this is pretty, pretty much the as much as that I, I uh, time as I can spend on this right now. And the land on which the, the rise on which this little thing has been worn down by all the activity, and so it is somewhat of a blank, pale space. Um, Oh, probably more gravel and, and uh, stones than anything else. The people do come there, the horses uh, trample it, and this is the starting off point for the tour, which goes off into the mountains over to the right. So here, um, I'm, I'm showing you this for, uh, for um, uh, buildings in environments and landscapes. Uh, and so while I'm trying to organize my uh, understanding of how you paint a horse from a distance, don't go away, I'll be right back. <laughs> Yes, while you while I with that short break took place, I kind of cheated and tried to do a, some itty bitty tiny horses in the distance. Not very successfully, but as I say, we are uh, the, these things require some time and they require a little bit more observation that I can give right now. Uh, the lodge, of course, has got to be put in, and then I'm going to concentrate for the last few minutes of this program uh, on the uh, reflections of the um, of the uh, of the lake to get the reflections kind of set in people's minds. The top of this lodge has a pale, uh, uh, according to my sketch has a pale roof line and then it's dark underneath it uh, so that can be done with just one simple stroke and then another it's a double one it's a very modern one apparently and this uh, the um, the roof line of this lodge and it's a rather good sized one because it does have all sorts of activities going on that I talked about before a gift shop and a restaurant and maybe even some overnight lodging so this is a fairly decent sized building up on this uh, on the rise above the uh, above the stables where the um, renting of the horses takes place all of this uh, may be of interest to you the place is called called Purgatory, Colorado. It's a little bit uh, west of Durango, uh, um, available to uh, any American, any citizen that has a car, any person, human being that has a car and is willing to drive out west. This is all, um, this is all available to the general public. It is not private, and it's, uh, it's uh, an extraordinary adventure to go off into these areas. Um, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the rise on which this is, I remember it was very manicured and good green lawns because it is after all a motel of some standing or a hotel and all of these lawns were rather well manicured and kept, uh, kept good down to the water's edge and that gets me to the point that I was going to, that I'm going to try to make and namely the water that we've got to deal with. Uh, this is a very cursory um, uh, interpretation of that lodge but you can get the idea of how you would have to work fast in order to capture all of these uh, all of these uh, very complex uh, forms shapes and problems of painting a landscape of this of this um, interest and so so much going on uh, the um, 
let me see, that's got to be a little bit more sandy colored. And I'm using some leftover colors from uh, uh, earlier uh, uh, mixings on uh, in this painting. Uh, the the the, um, the approach to doing the uh, water has got to be done with uh, observation. You do not simply stick something pale into a painting and call it a landscape just because I mean a, a water area because you put reflections in it. That is just not landscape painting that is just trying to make something up as you go along and hope that you're pulling it off uh, uh, reflections and me are have have a very long-standing relationship and i pay attention and i'm concerned about the um about the interpretation of reflections the land here according to my uh, according to my um uh, sketch is uh very pale there's probably not much going on here because this is in fact part of the uh of the dude ranch where people do bring the horses down to the little lake to drink and um so this is all trampled and trodden and therefore it's pale however it is not as pale as the sky the sky is the palest of all and the the, the lake is a mirror of the sky hence the the color the hence i love that hence the color of the sky that i've mixed before is the one that i'm going to use only a little bit paler uh add some more white so because there is a brilliance to water mm, that is uh that is to be paid attention to and water of course is not just a big blue area here in the foreground that is going to be trying to be passing as a lake it's going to have to be absolutely believable that this is in fact water and um yeah, water has many many colors um, uh, the water nearest you sometimes is it much darker than it is when it's far away it also uh, reflections are extremely mysterious and very arbitrary they don't ever do what you really think they ought to do you would think that this ranch is reflected in great detail down in this water it's not it's too far away it can't possibly be reflected these trees are tall enough to be reflected but the how the lodge is not tall enough to be reflected so the sketch is what tells me that i couldn't possibly have made that up the sketch tells me that what is reflected is the uh, the tall trees behind the lodge Many, many of these painting shows tell you whatever is above the whatever is above the water gets reflected. Well, it doesn't. It depends upon how far away it is. So, with all of this in mind, and hopefully the information is of some use, I'm going to show you how you do the reflections. You do not pull a bunch of color down from up above and hope that that's going to be a reflection. You you purposefully paint the reflection as you see it. My sketch tells me that this reflection is very diffuse. It is not these trees in, in, in exact replica of those trees. It's got to be below it, but it, there is a diffusion around it, and it is to be mixed with the oils, uh, very carefully mixed with the uh, oil color that I've just put on for the water, and uh, the diffusion is uh, not to be questioned. Whatever, whatever causes that is what makes the, um, is what makes the reflection believable uh, it is diffuse and then all, uh, um, there is a an in, directly below this tree uh, I mean below it is where the tree actually becomes reflected but it is not ex it is not exact it is just a suggestion of what those two trees do in reflections on the on this uh, on this little lake it is um, it is not a formula. It can't possibly be the same reflection as you're going to find on the other side of the painting. This is about all that you need to do. Maybe even diffuse this a little bit more. This side, this side of the tree has to be diffused a little bit more and pulled it down to a point, uh, as my sketch tells me. Over here, it's a different story. The lake has become darker. It is more than likely uh, a, uh, a nondescript palish brown green tone, which the um, which the entire landscape has helped to make uh, to to turn this color. The trees, uh, the land is reflected and the trees are also reflected. There is, a, 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 I, I can't explain why this reflection goes off into this pattern, but the sketch tells me that that's what it did. Uh, you can't work without them. You, uh, there's no way of being able to explain why this reflection here is so diffuse and why the brilliance of that lake uh, comes off into this, uh, into this kind of shape here, nor why it's this, uh, why it's 
this uh, triangle. Well, try this 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 angle here. I do know from water painting that there are disturbances on the surface of the water, which means that you would pull some of the color from here or over it to make your uh, the water distur the uh, surface disturbances of this lake uh, plausible. Now, um, I think I better put the surface disturbances later because uh, the trees I see are re are reflected a little bit more. Um, uh, visibly than the, uh, th this diffuse kind of um, shadowy color here. But this is the general feeling of the, uh, of the um, reflection of these trees. And here we are, a little sap green, some of my trusty um, uh, burnt sienna. And the trees are going to, this big tree directly below here is going to be putting in a, uh, is giving me a kind of a, a, a totally um, a suggestive uh, reflection, not a mirror reflection at all. Uh, there is, uh, the, the mirror reflections are, uh, are sometimes possible, but certainly not every time. There is no way you can tell me that these trees are going to be mirror reflected in a, a water surface that has disturbances on the surface of the water and is going to diffuse all reflections. The, uh, the sketch tells me that there is a tree trunk here which is, uh, which is visible and, and, and dark enough to be able to be picked up in the reflections. Also these two, these two tree trunks are visible enough to be picked up in the reflections uh, quite uh, distinctly. Uh, and as you can see, it's all very purposefully done and carefully observed. Uh, woe be unto the poor student or amateur painter that falls for the business of making reflections the way the, the, way the, uh, the mountain painting uh, uh, television programs are showing you. The, the, the best thing that can happen is that you have learned to never do it again. Um, uh, so uh, as I come to the end of this, I hope that my, I hope that some, I didn't, maybe not enough humor went into it, but uh, my, um, my uh, need to get all of this out into the open, that whatever is happening out there with these programs, <laughs> I'm afraid, is counterproductive. It is not doing uh, the job that it ought to do. Hopefully this is, uh, have been of some information and some use to you. The shoreline apparently has gotten a little bit of darkness around it because all sorts of things are happening there and there's also it looks to me like a little rock formation or a little dam that has been set inside here in my sketch so being faithful to uh, to what I what I draw I'm going to just indicate it now if when I get to refining this I will probably make this a lot more distinct and make sure that that is understandably a little a little dam in here uh, to to hold some back some of the water well as usual time has flown I'm sorry to say that we have gone through half an hour in what seems to be about three minutes. Thank you for watching. I hope you got something out of it. If you didn't, I'll do it again. Repetition is the best teacher. Thanks again. Pat Windrow signing off from the Cable Easel.